Welcome to the Fangled Cast, brought to you by Fangled Technologies, where we help you convert every person your company touches into a voracious advocate for your brand. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Fangled Cast. Today, I've got a new friend of mine, Mansour Khametov. And yeah, I pronounced that name differently because he's from Kazakhstan, but lives here in the U.S. And he is a professor at Indiana University in Indiana, obviously, in Bloomington. And we're going to talk quite a bit today about the core of, of my business most of my life, which is international trade and the nuances of cultures in different parts of the world and how that relates to marketing and everything else related to international trades. This should be really interesting. Before I screw up his bio, how about I let Mansoor tell you a little bit about himself and his history and what he does. Thank you so much, Andrew. I appreciate the kind invite. So uh, I'm currently indeed based in the US at the Kelly School of Business, Indiana University, where I uh, primarily uh, teach and research marketing, consumer behavior, uh, brand management, uh, consumer psychology, and so on. So that's kind of my pretty much bread and butter, both uh, academic and more of an industry applied type of research, as well as the educational space. And before that, uh, which which is why I thought, Andrew, uh, your uh, podcast is super relevant. I actually had uh, quite a few international experiences. So uh, before the US, I was based in Singapore doing very similar things that I do in terms of teaching and research and marketing. And then before that was Canada and a region I am from Central Asia, Kazakhstan. So I've kind of over the years had this bunch of uh, fascinating experiences. Yeah, Kazakhstan is, is one of those places that, that fascinates me um, in that when, when I used to travel constantly for work and people who know me know why I've got you, immediately know the moment they saw your name, why you're on the show. But it's one of those places that you would mention in the United States You'd say, oh, yeah, we're, we're talking to a client in Kazakhstan. And they go, oh, come on, you made that place up. Or Uzbekistan. Really? That's, that's a place? And, and even to the point that, that in meetings with people who don't know geography, you know, it's uh, somewhere a stand. It's, it's one of these, these countries that people don't recognize that when, when the Soviet Union finally ended being the Soviet Union, there were lots of these places that had been enveloped. And, and the cultures... Although I'm sure there's still uh, a Soviet flavor to people who grew up not with their native language like yourself, um, tell, tell us a little bit about just to understand what Kazakhstan is like and, and what kind of an economy and the government and what's going on there now since it's no longer part of the Soviet Union. Uh, I would say so at least a couple of, of things, right? And, and kind of uh, growing up there, uh, being there, I'm always fascinating with, with that area and with that culture. And of course, you have to take this with a little bit of, um, you know, grain of salt because I I'm obviously haven't lived there for quite a while now fully, sure. uh, other than the guests visiting and stuff like that. But I'd say it's a pretty unique melting pot in many ways. So you definitely have your uh, local uh, kind of Kazakh flavor, which is basically like Central Asian uh, approach to doing things and mentality. Uh, but at the same time, it is mixed very much with uh, kind of Russian or I'd say rather um, former Soviet uh, flavor and background. And in addition, obviously, as, as sort of globalization propels forward, you absolutely see um, a bunch of uh, Western influences and stuff like that. And, and, and of course, uh, from China, there's also big presence and influence. So it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating how all these things play together in shaping uh, identities of, of local folks. So if I was going down the streets in, in, in the capital prior to the fall or prior to the change when it was no longer part, I would have seen Soviet mosaics on the buildings. I would have seen statues to Soviet leaders and things like that. And now most of that's been erased or is there still you know, uh, a presence? Uh, there, there, I'd say there still is, right? So it's kind of like, a big part of legacy and heritage, right? And I, and again, I'm not a political scientist or political sure. expert, but to the best of my understanding, uh, there, there has been a very consolidated effort to preserve this kind of heritage and legacy. So of course, all things change over time, there's evolution, but there is uh, still pretty substantial element of, of that kind of uh, aspect. So what, what's the relationship with Kazakhstan to say China, to Russia, to the US and to Europe uh, in terms of being able to do business? 
Uh, so the business environment is, uh, and that I think is like if you monitor the development of the country over the years, right? Um, the very nice and cool thing about it is that uh, country sort of more on the macro societal, uh, also individual, but also like the country level, uh, they've managed to maintain very sound and solid relationships. And that is certainly helpful when it comes to doing business, right? So in the sure. sense that there's no major tensions or conflicts and they try to be kind of equally open and, and friendly whether it comes to, again, to the uh, like two big powerful neighbors, uh, but also sort of more in the global environment. So I would say in terms of business, again, as long as you have that expertise, as long as you have your unique offering, uh, you should largely be able to be uh, kind of in good shape. If, if I was a, a company seeking something new to bring into the US market and, and thought, I wonder if Kazakhstan has something that could be competitive for us to, to bring to the US, what, what might that be in terms of what's made in Kazakhstan? Huh, good question. So I hadn't really considered that, but let me let me sort of kind of give you a couple of, so I think sure. the big, and, and again, I have to sort of um, tell you that. So as I mentioned, in terms of my background, uh, the biggest thing that I'm excited about is, is branding, right? right. So, and uh, if we think about Kazakhstan as a country or nation brand, again, like you said in the introduction, a lot of it kind of flies under the radar. So if you talk to a regular person from overseas, they would not be able to, again, to sort of name that well. And part of it is because I think traditionally the country has, um, when it's been known, it's been known for, again, for this rich natural resources and oil and gas and uranium and all, all those kinds of things, which again, which are great, uh, yeah. but they, they have a natural tendency to run out. So you have to kind of innovate, go beyond that. So if you were to ask me, what are some of these kind of cool things that you may potentially explore from Kazakhstan? Just off the top of my head, I would say uh, a couple of local drinks uh, that uh, if there's like um, camel's milk uh, mm -hmm. and, and there's sort of a couple of associated drinks, right? Like they, uh, especially when, I mean, like talking to my friends that, uh, that are not from there, when they taste it, they're like, they go like, oh, this is interesting. I haven't ever tasted some, something similar, but there is potential there. Uh, turns out there is um, very much under the radar uh, Kazakh chocolate. So you would never associate Kazakhstan probably with like chocolate. It's not Switzerland yeah. or anything, but but it's surprisingly good. So the chocolate huh. is called uh, Kazakhstan and it actually has like a very nice, um, uh, not not to promote them, like obviously I'm not paid or anything by them, yeah. but they, they have this very nice national kind of um, ornament, uh, like a like a flag and, and stuff like that. It, it's beautiful. So in terms of packaging as well. I'm assuming the raw the raw materials are imported, though. The climate isn't such for growing the cacao and. In, in, yeah, in uh, good question. I think so. To the best of my memory, at least the way I know him. So a lot of a lot of it still sort of is done um, domestically on site. But but I agree with you, like in terms of the like some of the underlying dynamics in terms of like mm -hmm. agriculture and growing stuff. Uh, yeah, like some regions would be more conducive to that than others. Sure, sure. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, if I'm if I'm an American businessman and I'm looking to expand my company into a region like Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, that 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 whole all of those those countries that most Americans don't even know exist, um, what kind of need exists in those markets that that an American company might be able to fill? Again, looking, so I think the biggest shift, I guess, uh, in a way, or the biggest change has been happening um, locally in some of those markets. And again, I am uh, even up to this day still quite familiar with some of those in part, sure. thanks to my um, industry background to sort of that Central Asia region. So one of the biggest shifts has been uh, increase in discretionary income. So whereas traditionally it was pretty, pretty tight for many people, Obviously, we see emergence of affluent consumer. We see emergence of sort of this uh, need uh, to go beyond the basic necessities and kind of uh, sure. more possessions, more materialism and so on. So I would say, uh, so like, again, uh, more of the luxury goods sector. And by luxury goods, I don't necessarily just mean like the, the actual like clothes or stuff like that, just more of a accessories, yeah. things like that. Uh, also, some of the more... Uh, kind of intellectual economy technologies, uh, whether sort of consumer technology like Internet of Things, uh, like all the uh, software and services. So I would say a lot of it. So 
sort of the local market has done a lot to to innovate uh, and and as you know i mean looking even back at the soviet heritage and stuff like that there's always been a legacy of having good um technicians engineers statisticians and kind of like internet folks but uh there, there's still room to grow so i would say a lot of those kind of more so uh, ict type of sector so like technology infrastructure mm -hmm. um interesting interesting well let's 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 move on uh, now that i've satisfied some some of my curiosity and i'm sure some of the audience um let's talk about about branding on a, on a global global market and, and and the reason i sort of started with with the country is you know when when you think about branding of of products, you also think about the branding of, of where it came from. When, when I was a kid, if you looked at the label and it said made in Taiwan, you saw made in China, it was the Taiwanese product is probably significantly better than the Chinese product. And over time, as a country, they've worked very hard on their brand that they're now making higher tech and, and otherwise. What, what do you think someone would, would say as they look at a label from that region, Kazakhstan, Turkmen, those, those places? Do you do you think that that those countries are actually working on improving their reputation, their brand as as a, a market for us, or is that still way down the way down the, the road before that occurs? Mm -hmm. uh, so, Andrew, I think that uh, first of all, so exactly like you referred. So, if we look at the uh, branded research, there's really cool stuff on uh, country brands and and also sort of place brands. Sure. But but there's also especially more on the cross cultural consumer behavior research. There's stuff that uh, is more of what we call country of origin effects, which is exactly sure. what you have in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, and again, this would be just my personal, rather subjective take on this, but uh, there's absolutely still room to grow, right? Although I'm sure um, like the, the businesses, the government and just regular consumers, they're doing a lot uh, to kind of promote that image and sort of ser send certain associations. Again, uh, talking even to, uh, well, like, I mean, I I'm kind of a, an example from that, right? When I go, uh, with, like, meet people in the U.S. or Canada or elsewhere, uh, again, they uh, many of them kind of don't put two and two together, so don't they don't necessarily have strong, well-established associations. So if they see something like made in Kazakhstan, uh, for most people, it, it actually it doesn't mean anything negative, but it also doesn't mean anything positive. So it's pretty much like an mm -hmm. empty vessel, which which I think is already. Uh, like a fascinating area to to work in because if you're able to instill those associations and to build that uh, those attitudes, that can be like a huge game changer. Yeah, the, it, it's funny. There, there's a lot of a lot of markets like that where all of the incumbent players either have a good or a bad reputation. But when you don't have a reputation either way, it it, it can really lead to your advantage in 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 the curiosity factor and getting going. Um, there, there's. Uh, there's a lot of industries where, um, like I, I'll give an example of a word that has a bad brand, sales. If you talk to most <laughs> oh, yeah. people, oh, I don't want to be sold. I don't make it salesy. And people have sort of turned that word. So companies have changed. They don't even have salespeople. They have customer uh, representatives. They have business exactly. development. They've, they've created all of these terms to get past. So from a, from a branding perspective, that, that's kind of interesting because you know, when 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 you start to look, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your work in, in Singapore and some other places next, but uh, that that's one of those things that, that fascinates me how how we use words, um, or or the lack of reputation can actually be a real positive, in in a sea of reputations. <laughs> exactly, like a blank slate, so to speak. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about in the the global the global market the approaches that change in terms of, of how you bring products to market in say a place like a Singapore or Canada or Europe or these other places. Uh, what, what are the signs and sort of the things that, that companies should look to as they're starting to, to expand and look at new markets in a different way than they would look, especially here in the US. American companies that have been selling the American way are now gonna go to say Singapore or go to Europe. What should they have in mind to, to start to research before they just jump in? So um, I, I think at least, uh, well, what you bring up is a very valid perspective. Uh, we, and when we talk about internationalization and sort of, uh, again, more like a global approach to marketing and, and branding and uh, go to market, there are a lot of um, kind of things that sometimes may go under the radar, but it's super important to research them. So I was actually talking to my uh, students in my consumer behavior class the other day, 
And we uh, talk a lot there about uh, what I call um, cross-cultural marketing blunders. So yes. uh, it's, it's, it's insane how sometimes, you, you know, you, you would think that a lot of these, especially, and I'm not even talking about small and medium-sized businesses. So some of the bigger, larger companies like corporations, uh, when they go abroad, um, sometimes what happens is that things, as you may know, get lost in translation. Sometimes it's literally kind of like translation is either has a negative connotation or, or sort of mm -hmm. maybe something neutral, but that doesn't make sense. But other times it's not even necessarily like literally the language, but the way uh, local business practices are conducted or sort of some of the local um, specificities and so on. So again, very, very uh, cautious, and very important to have a solid approach because things can backfire easily and kind of unravel very fast. So that would be my yeah. kind of first thing that comes to mind. And I'm happy to chat more about that. Yeah, no, it's I, I've seen those. Some of those examples aren't actually true. There's one yes, years true. ago that, 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 you, that we've heard that uh, Chevrolet couldn't sell the Nova in Mexico because Nova is won't go in Spanish. The Nova sold very well in Mexico. And the other, there was a, a, a doll when I was a kid called the Cabbage Patch doll. And they said, oh, you can't sell those in Latin America because they look like a demon from their mythology. Also nonsense. But, yeah, it's, but what it, we call it's like urban legends. School. Yeah, it's business school is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, and that's actually one of the things that, that again, we, uh, again, going back to your point, when you internationalize, you go abroad, uh, you have to make sure that you also do your good homework and research, right? Like what's an urban legend and urban rumor versus what is actually factually yep. true? Yeah, one, one blunder that I made years ago, I, I lived in Brazil for a number of years, and there, there used to be an expression here that, you know, it's so easy, you can teach monkeys to do it. Well, I, you know, as a speaker of Portuguese, I learned and I was already fluent, never realized that any reference would be taken racially to, to, to monkeys. And I had no idea. And I just directly translated that and the wind left the room. There was silence. And I what, what did I do? And then someone explained to me, that, you know, obviously apologized and let them know that there was no, but, but it, it certainly put a, put a uh, freeze on what was a pretty lively training uh, about using some, some really basic equipment. And, and the selling point was that of all of the equipment in this particular sector, this was the easiest for anybody to learn. The, the, the quickest learning curve, it was the value of the product. You just don't refer to monkeys when you talk about it because people took that as as a racial slur which it absolutely wasn't wasn't intended to be so yeah, a lot of very delicate intricacies for sure yeah so instead maybe i should have said you could have taught children to do it you could teach unskilled people to do it whatever but the fact that i happened to pick an animal that to many was considered racial was not a good was not a good thing i felt horrible about it for, for a long time of course i didn't know but yeah even so i should have known so Tell, tell me maybe maybe some some examples of projects that you've been aware of where companies had to completely adapt what they were doing with their brand to be able to work in different markets. Uh, happy to. Uh, I mean, uh, I'll go as, as basic or as simple as uh, even back to my own, um, some of the branding ex industry experience that I did. So back in yeah. the days, uh, I was uh, employed at, at P&G, Procter & Gamble. Sure. And P&G, obviously, uh, they're like a huge... A multinational corporation that has has a history of being present in uh, like hundreds and hundreds of markets, and of course, as a virtue of that, right, you you have always sort of the following structure such that you have your what is called RBU, or regional business unit, where uh, you have folks. Uh, in in our case, it was uh, mostly in Geneva, in Switzerland. So we're talking like Western Europe, that develop templates, toolkits, designs that then they subsequently send to the local uh, and regional brand management teams that then sort of take a look. If, if it works completely, if they think it's gonna be successful, they make minor or tiny adaptations and then they sort of use that to subsequently brand uh, the new initiative, whichever that may be. Uh, if it's not, however, uh, sometimes they also make changes and adjustments. And this is exactly what happened uh, to me personally. So back in the days I was in charge of uh, a portfolio of um, several brands. So we're talking about uh, Kame, Safeguard, uh, Oral-B, and, and Crest. So in, and in our local market, it was known as Blendamed. So at that time, we had an initiative for, for Kame, which is like a major big new launch of 
uh, deodorants and, and, and like antiperspirants and so on. And the fascinating thing to me was that when we look at the, um, when we got the sort of um, the toolkits and templates from the markets, uh, looking especially at the, uh, the Western European templates, and then we also sort of saw what was happening in Russia, because Russia is another sort of seemingly close, uh, but also seemingly different market. Uh, I look at the, all these materials and <clears throat> visuals and kind of uh, key, key visuals, and what I see is a lot of um, kind of like a lot of nakedness, right? So like na naked hands, naked, naked, whatever. Uh, so, so a lot of sort of this more um, adventurous image and kind of like uh, less conservative, less traditional, let me put it that way. Sure, sure. So, uh, and, it's, and especially, and again, uh, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, wow. So uh, I had, and obviously we talked to consumers, we talked to like, you know, our fellow brand managers to understand sort of where the, that would be, appropriate and acceptable but at that very point when i first saw it i was like oh there's a good chance it won't fly with local consumers and if, if you look at kazakhstan again things change things evolve so i wouldn't necessarily even today's society put it as like on average super conservative <laughs> traditional but in some ways it still is a bit more conservative or traditional especially when it comes to certain uh, like visual displays or consumerist values and so on. So at that moment, I realized that we have to make some adaptations. We have to kind of, uh, you know, change that a little bit. We have to uh, have that approach, whereas we display less of those kind of, you know, bodily parts and so on. So again, this is just seemingly simple, small example, but like, yeah, realistically, when we go into different markets, we just can't take for granted the things that work somewhere, let's say, I mean, yeah. like Western Europe or, or even Russia, that they would necessarily be easily adaptable and translatable to some of the other local markets. So I think this is, uh, hopefully that serves as a, as a good example of what you have in mind. Yeah, it really does. Uh, years ago before, <laughs> before PowerPoint, and we used to do flip charts. Yeah. I used to have a presentation where we would show a company's ad in a place like Saudi Arabia, in a place like France, in a place like uh, South Africa, and in the US. And look at just the difference of the image of the face, of the clothing, of what was there. And it was always just so vastly different uh, in terms of brand adaptation. I was in Saudi Arabia once. You look around at the billboards and all you see are men dressed as Saudis holding products, you know, because of their, their conservative nature and, and Islamic law that, that exists in those countries. Same product somewhere else. You'll see uh, an attractive gentleman with a tie and a suit. In another country, you'll see uh, a, a typical model, female model in the same. So yeah, it's what you're describing is, is, is really important for, for people to understand. Even, even the value proposition of a product changes from, from market to market. I'm wondering if, if when you were with P&G, you saw that there were certain features or certain benefits of a product that meant nothing in some countries that were so important in others. Can you, I'm kind of putting you on the spot to come up with an obscure example, but. No, hundred percent. And, and especially if we, so what you, I'll just kind of mention a couple of things here, sure, uh, sure. what you said. Uh, and again, like uh, I, looking at your background, right? Like you've done a lot of cool things with like international trade and, and stuff like that. So I think this, Stand, like in, in international marketing, we call it standardization versus adaptation. So very similar uh, paradigm that like, what do you do? Do you sort of take extreme or do you find a middle ground? So it's always a very big and real concern. But yeah, in terms of the, I mean, uh, th there's uh, even looking at, so I'm not sure if that would be the perfect example, but anyway, it's something that comes off, off the top of my head. But yeah, looking at some of these beyond even, different brand or uh, advertising communications that you may kind of do depending on the country, even the basic uh, product formulations and, and features vary. So looking at, uh, especially if, even up until day, if you look at uh, some of the markets like India, for example, for PNG and even for Unilever and so on, a bunch of other companies, uh, what, what is a very popular SQ there uh, is uh, typically this more of a like smaller sized package, like almost sure. in some markets, you may think about it as a sampler, like a sample size. Uh, but again, uh, it is incredibly in, in many categories, it is incredibly popular there. And big part of it is driven by just the way people consume, but also the way they uh, receive their wages and their income sure. and sort of how they try to 
uh, make both both ends meet and so on. So some of these things, again, you would be like, Absolutely. why is this so popular? Or like, wh why do people do it? But it's it totally makes sense once you do your better research. Yeah, there in, in the industrial space and, and in the you know equipment, for example, when we were working with painting machinery in Brazil, that it was a non-existent market. Nobody knew that it was there. So as opposed to all of the, the benefit stories in the US to sell this equipment was why you should upgrade to even better equipment. Mm -hmm. so, so the actual value proposition was, if you switch to this machine, you're gonna get better efficiency, better coatings. In a market where it didn't exist, you can't talk about upgrading what you don't have. Exactly. So, so the value prop was, was, was very different in that if you buy this, this is what it means in terms of labor savings, in terms of all the basic reasons you want the machine, not why you want to upgrade the machine. Yeah, you kind so, of want to educate your customer base first, right? Like to kind of get yeah. them up to speed and uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like that example. Thanks for providing that. Yeah, it, you know, when, it, when it's, we, we talk about, is it, a, is it a new product or replacement market? when it comes to, to technology. And I would think also from your background in, in, um, in the cosmetic world and, and things that Procter & Gamble brought to market, um, fragrance portfolios and, and ingredients probably very significantly. Some places where a certain aroma is just the best and other places it's foul. That that oh yeah, big, big time. And, and the, I mean, so, and that's where the field of sensory marketing is fascinating, like you said. Uh -huh sense and, and smells also colors right colors have diametrically opposite meanings in in cultures and so on and even uh, and again uh kind of talking about png for instance like one of the things that i i wasn't in charge of that portfolio of business but one of the things that surprised me when i myself was sort of learning about company more if you look exactly what you said at their fragrance portfolio and what they mm. kind of like license and franchise and then sell under their name it's so huge, but but again, it it would uh, dramatically vary both in terms of the offerings across the market, but also in terms of popularity. So some some kind of <laughs> some products just don't work in certain places. And yeah. as a brand manager, you kind of I mean there are some things you may do about it, but if they're fundamentally not appealing, uh, again, it's it's pretty limiting. So in that sense, you just have to uh, re adjust your approach essentially and kind of re re realign that. Yeah. And, you know, today for the audience, you know, we're, we're talking about just sort of the, the marketing and, and product development side of things. We haven't talked about trade relationships. We haven't talked about distribution uh, paths to market, all those kinds of things, which are a whole different topic that complicate international trade. And it's really why companies like mine and guys like you uh, get brought in on so many projects, because these are the things that scare folks about taking their market globally. And it shouldn't. Because there's experts out there who can help them sort of step on the right stones to get across that that river of, of fear to get to where you could be really successful in that global market. So uh, we're kind of running out of time. So I want to ask my favorite question. Is there something I should have asked you that I didn't that you just got to tell the audience? Uh, good question. So <laughs> I, I, <laughs> kind of putting me on the spot. Okay. Of course. Uh, That's my uh, job. Th that's exactly what you do, right? So uh, I don't know, nothing much, I guess, comes off the top of my head, but uh, probably, yeah, like I think the big topic in, in, and again, I have to kind of, I guess, remind the audience that I'm coming here these days, at least from the academic background. So I think the biggest question that actually folks like I get asked is about like, are you kind of just doing abstract theory and sitting in your ivory tower and like doing something that's super remote from reality versus like, are you really doing anything much to contribute to the industry and kind of bridge that academia practice gap closer? So um, yeah, I'm not sure if I, if I wanna, I kind of put it in your mouth if I wanna go ahead and answer it, but that's probably would be the question. Yeah, well, you know, the, one of the reasons that I, I, I brought you on the show, besides the fact that I think it's interesting where you're from and, and, and getting sort of that different flavor of international trade, but also that so many times you come across guys in academia that never actually did what they're teaching. And you're a guy who had great success doing, and now you're sharing that with students, which I think adds significant credibility to the program. Uh, and your students are very lucky to have you because I, I, hear, you, I hear great stuff. So I really appreciate you coming on the show today. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Pleasure has been all mine. Uh, they hope the audience enjoys it. And thanks again for the invite. Absolutely. And for those of you at home on your treadmill, I don't know, in your hot tub, 
wherever you are listening, watching, paying attention or not paying attention, we'd, we'd love to have you subscribe. So you got to kind of click down here on the subscribe button so that you can join future podcasts of the Fangled Cast. And uh, you can share it, you can like it, you can comment on it, call an old person up, send a fax, I don't know, smoke signals, get more people involved to check out future broadcasts. And we'll be back again probably next week with another interesting episode. Thank you again so much, Mansoor, for, for coming on. Brought to you by Fangle Technologies, where we help you convert every person your company touches into a voracious advocate for your brand.